before I introduce um, the, the Anjali and the lecture today, we also have a second lecture on Monday, um, this Monday called Genealogy, a story of um, Jin's truth making in post partition Delhi, which is a study of a particular site in Delhi called Yosha Kotla, where applications or RCs are written to Jin's because the site is considered a portal for inter, a different kind of mobility and different kind of scale for interdimensional. And so it's about, it's about ritual practice, sacred geographies, and thinking about the urban um, through ideas of faith. So if you, Monday, same spot, 6 30. But for today, we're very happy. Anjali and I have been trying to set up this talk date for a really long time. And so the last round we tried to find a date, we decided we would count the number of email it, emails it takes to get someone to give a talk to IHS. Um, so then it, it was going very well and it was all very precise. And then she said that was easy. And then another 12 emails resulted because of a date change. So the jinx is broken, she is here. So Anjali Karan Mohan is a, Dr. Anjali Karan Mohan, who has become, has become since we last saw her, um, has a PhD from IIIT and is an urban and regional planner, practitioner, and consultant, has been involved in a range of projects. Uh, and she's speaking to us today about municipal reforms and governance in Karnataka. The talk is titled From Hierarchy to Heterarchy. And I think it's going to be a really, really fruitful talk. And Anjali will have about, take about 40, 45 minutes. And I'll ask you guys to hold your questions till the end, and we'll have half an hour for discussion. Um, and she will be here afterwards as well. And I'm going to ask you now to take a moment and just reach in and make sure that you put your phone on silent, even though I'm absolutely certain that you guys did. Um, and uh, head over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Gopal. And uh, thank you for the First, a big thanks to IHS for giving me this opportunity uh, to come and speak to you. And then, a uh, thanks to all of you who have come and traveled, uh, braved the traffic in Bangalore to come and listen. And uh, I think it's, you know, to be able to take out that time and come, come and listen is a big thing, actually. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, we have an hour and a half, right? And I will be speaking for about 45 minutes and 45 minutes, and then following which we will uh, have the question hour session. My talk today will focus on the role of the state in emerging organizational and institutional forms. And uh, I will be looking at one such form, which is called the network form of governance, also referred to as heterarchies. And uh, essentially, I will be looking at the role of the state through the case of the Municipal Reforms Program in the state of Karnataka, India. Uh, much of what I'm going to speak about today straddles uh, scholarships on development, on organizational and institutional frameworks, on uh, public policy, governance and e-governance. And whatever I'm going to present today is going to essentially engages with the dominant debates within these scholarships. So uh, very quickly, I will lay the context uh, for my talk by tracing the trajectory of the development debate in the post-World War II period. Within that, I will be focusing on the role of the state. I will then look at emerging organizational and institutional forms and will then point to certain gaps in literature which allows me to raise the research questions. I will try and address these research questions through the case study of the Municipal Reforms Program and I will conclude my talk by outlining the policy implications. Okay. Now if you look at the um, development debate, um, which really emerged in the post-World War II period, for most part of the 20th century, it has largely been either a state-led or a uh, market-led process. Um, it was only to, in, the post, in the last decade of the 20th century that states and markets were recognized as complementary rather than adversarial uh, modes of coordination. And this in turn led to public-private partnerships uh, as modes of coordination to deliver on development challenges or development problems which are essentially wicked in nature. Now, um, what really, or the realization that came even post the public-private partnerships phase was that wicked problems continue to be wicked and therefore there was this call for alternatives to states and markets. There was a demand for alternative modes of coordination which were different 
or so to say would operate at least different from the way the states and markets were operating. Now what is interesting also, apart from the transitions that happened in the develop development debate, what is also interesting was the transitions that happened in the context for development. Now in the last, in the last quarter of the 20, uh, 20th century, uh, contemporary globalization processes as well as uh, contemporary globalization triggered by information, communication and technologies as well as localization processes um, uh, gained pace rapidly and what it resulted was in, in the, uh, it really made uh, several <coughs> supranational and subnational uh, levels of the state as well as non-state actors suddenly became visible and they became prominent in a domain which was, which traditionally belonged to the state in terms of uh, delivering on development goals. Now, what this led to was several collaborations between state and non-state actors and together these actually resulted in the emergence of several uh, organizational and institutional forms which are different from the markets and the states and these were being essentially, these are being essentially being relied upon to deliver on development problems. I am going to look at one such form and that is called the heterarchy or the network form of governance. What is a heterarchy? A heterarchy is, is nothing but just wide ranging, wide ranging partnerships between the public, the private and uh, civil society, each of which constitutes a node within the network and often these rely on ICTs to deliver and to function. Now the state which has been the main, um, the main mode of coordination is one node amongst the many in a network form of governance and therefore needs to function very differently. Now how are these distinct, it is, in, there, there is a lot of uh, debate within literature whether these are really distinct from hierarchies and heterarchies and some of the dominant debates say that these are network forms of governance or heterarchies are different because they rely on a completely different operating code. For example, hierarchies rely essentially or the state relies on administrative fiat and routine as a mode of operation. Markets in turn rely on contracts. Heterarchies, it is said, rely on substantial, uh, on reflexive uh, rationality and use negotiation, coordination, dialogue and knowledge sharing as a um, operating code. And because they rely on ICT, they are supposed to have distinct efficiency advantages primarily because they allow communication in real time and therefore this enables them to cope with change and because they have this efficiency advantage, they are cited appropriate to deal with wicked problems of development. Now what, is how, what has been also happening in the contemporary development discourse is that most international organizations, especially the donor organizations as well as national governments have been within the development debate advocating the fudging of heterarchies as a means to deliver on development, primarily to uh, pursue efficient governance at and more so at a decentralized level. Uh, I won't get too much into the details, but if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them later. I'm just trying here to lay the context for why, for my work. Okay, now as I said, the state is one uh, node amongst the several in a hierarchy. What literature also says is that the state is a central node. Therefore, meaning therefore that it is a node which is absolutely critical to the functioning of the heterarchy. As a central node, the safe state is said to be basically responsible for facilitating meta-governance. Now, <coughs> meta-governance is not really a, a superordinate level of government. It is just a mechanism by which the state creates the environment such that the various nodes of the network are able to work together towards mutually defined goals while also being able to pursue their individual goals. And how does the state do this? It is largely through facilitating mutual understanding and dialogue, something that is termed as noise reduction. Now for the state to be able to facilitate meta-governance, it is essential for the state actually to transition from a command and control entity, a hierarchy, the way it is has been functioning uh, traditionally to an entity which is able to facilitate coordination and dialogue. However, there are certain questions within this uh, within this body of literature which do come uh, which have which remain unaddressed. These largely pertain to how does the state's centrality, while the state is central, how does this centrality manifest in the day-to-day fun -day functioning of the state? What how do, what are the implications of these manifestations? 
and basically how does meta governance occur how does it happen what does the state do to facilitate meta governance which till very recently till i think 2013 um, in some of the articles it was termed more or less a verbal innovation that there is no empirical evidence to show how meta governance actually happens Now, I'm going to try, uh, try and address these questions by looking at the Municipal Reforms Program of the Government of Karnataka, which is an e-governance intervention, mm -hmm. which essentially aims to further de decentralization by strengthening urban local bodies across the state through administrative reforms, which are um, implemented using common standards and processes. Now, a very quick timeline on the program. The program started as a pilot pilot in 49 urban local bodies in the in 2002-2003 and it was called the Nirmala Nagara program. In 2005-06 it was scaled as the Karnataka Municipal Reforms program and it was then at that point scaled to cover the remaining 164 urban local bodies in the state. So today the program essentially is being implemented across 213 urban local bodies in the state, essentially covering the entire state except the city of Bangalore. It was supposed to culminate in 2012, but has got uh, an extension, but received an extension till 2014 and has got recently another extension for completion of some of the reforms. Now, why did I look at the municipal reforms program? Because essentially because the organizational and institutional frameworks that the program <coughs> utilizes resembles the debate on hierarchies. Now, if you look at this particular graphic, the dotted lines are the hierarchies through which the state functions. So you will have the Ministry of Urban Development with all its urban development departments and they function as a hierarchy. Then Ministry of Science and Technology will function through the Department of Science and Technology. Similarly, Information and Communication Technology will function through Department of Information Technology. But in this particular program, the government of Karnataka actually went into horizontal collaborations. So the Ministry of Urban Development, for instance, is working with the Ministry of Science and Technology as well as Information and Communication Technology. So one, there is a horizontal collaboration within the program. Interestingly, there are also a lot of, uh, so there is also this collaboration between different systems. So you, E-Government's Foundation is a non, uh, is a NGO which was brought in to essentially deliver because the state did not have the skill of technology and E-Government's Foundation is a uh, NGO which works on developing and deploying technology. City Managers Association is another um, society, registered society, which was also brought in. There were a lot of other, Microsoft, iDEC, IP, these were all partners which came in at various points in time. And more importantly, at the local level, the urban local bodies, that is the 213 urban local bodies were considered as important nodes in the implementation of the program. And at, at the urban local body, the government of Karnataka has actually brought in an NGO. So today, every urban local body in the state of Karnataka has an NGO which has been roped in to deliver on this program, on, on the administrative reforms. Now, when I will be using this program to show how the state transitions from a command and control entity, how the state can transition, and what happens, how this centrality of the state manifests in the day-to-day -day functioning of the state, my basic premise is that, I mean, literature basically says that ICTs are, technology is what facilitates the formation of these networks and that is what is critical to the uh, formation and functioning of the networks. But I take this debate a little further and I say the manifestation of the de uh, reconfigured state is largely determined by the historical evolution of the nature, the structure and the functioning of the state. Right? So in particular, I say it is the champions of the state and the straight level, level bureaucrats who will actually determine how the state's manifestation happens. Now, as we all know that India, and from, for that matter, most developing states are basically centralized. These are barbarian states which are centralized two-tier states. And India, for instance, adopted decentralization as late as 1992 through the 74th Amendment to the Constitution. It transitioned to a three-tier uh, three state, but there, while there is a willingness to decentralize, there is also a resistance to decentralization, which exists within the state. And uh, there is enough empirical evidence and there is even enough uh, literature to show this resistance to decentralization. One of the most common, commonly cited reasons is basically the resistance to share power. The state government is not willing to share power with local governments. Now, I argue that it is this 
tension between a centralized state, you know, tension in the sen uh, tension between the state's willingness to pursue decentralization yet resisting it at the same time, which actually translates in what I call the centralized decentralization approach to the state, which will determine how the state's centrality will manifest in network forms of governance. And I show this, I show the centralized decentralization state, uh, approach of the state in the way the state will mediate the enactment of technology within this e-governance uh, program. And this will become evident as we go along. Okay, a very quick, uh, 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 this thing on the methods that I used. I basically looked at mixed method. Methods are relied heavily on semi-structured qualitative interviews, both of individuals and groups of individuals. I relied heavily on focused dis uh, group discussions as well as participant ob observations. I conducted approximately 100 interviews in the state, in the city of Bangalore, as well as the urban local bodies across the state of Karnataka, including I did some interviews in Delhi uh, at the central level. Most of my interviews were in Kannada, some were in English and Hindi. The field work extended for about six months in 2012 and 2013. And uh, I looked at two habitats, uh, two reform. Uh, I looked at two reforms of the municipal reforms program, which is basically a basket of five reforms in two urban local bodies. Now, uh, what I would like to, before I start looking at the evolution of the heterarchy and the role of the state in that, I would like you to very quickly keep in mind the fact that this particular reforms program targets three stakeholders. One is the state of Karnataka, which is represented by the Directorate of Municipal Administration, also referred to as the DMA. The Directorate of Municipal Administration is essentially responsible for supervising, this is a state level uh, department, which is responsible for supervising and monitoring the urban local bodies. And it is, they believe that in this supervision and monitoring, they will be able to strengthen the urban local bodies to function as units of self-governance. The urban local bodies are themselves supposed to emerge as strengthened units of governance. And finally, what the program argues is that the citizen is the pivot of the program. The citizen stands to gain because he or she will have access to enhanced uh, access to improved service delivery. So as the program is being implemented, the DMA is the main owner and driver of these uh, reforms. And it is ultimately envisaged that the urban local bodies will take or uh, will assume ownership of these reforms. Now um, I will look at the program. At, I will look at the program at the state level, how it has functioned and what has been the role of the state, and then I will f move to how these reforms are actually how this role of the state is impacting the outcome of the reforms at the urban local body. Now the program actually the discussion started in 2003 as a pilot in one of the uh, wards in a municipality close to Bangalore. At this point in time, it was largely between DMA and ECOV, and they were trying to see how these administrative reforms can be introduced. These are e-governance reforms, and I think what is important over here to remember is that while 2005, 2006, uh, with the JNNURM program, there has been a lot of focus on uh, e-governance reforms, but when this program started, there was very little talk of using technology within public administration. So there was no clear path as to how this can be done. And uh, there was a lot of experimentation that happened. And of course, uh, the state in itself, that is DMA, did not have the skills of deploying, developing and deploying technology. Hence, uh, they had to, in a sense, look at, look at a partner. Now, as, they were, as this was uh, happening, there was also this felt need to map urban local bodies, especially for some of the reforms like property taxation and information systems reform that was introduced. And it was at this time that the DMA brought in the Survey of India as, a, as an agency which was responsible for mapping, mapping the urban local bodies. Now, interestingly, it was only when the, it was only a, a year or two years later that any kind of formal agreements were signed between the DMA and the um, Survey of Indian e-governance. So before that, the relation, the working was more or less experimental and there were no formal agreements through which the work was happening. Now, as the work, uh, and, and in 2004, it started in 49 urban local bodies as a pilot. But when this started in 49 urban local bodies, there was also this felt need for acquiring domain knowledge. And there was an acknowledgement that this domain knowledge exists largely within urban local bodies. Urban local bodies are the ones who are 
who have the legacy data, they are the ones who understand these processes and therefore have to be roped in as important nodes. So they were brought in and essentially through monthly meetings that were being that were happening. So all U ULBs, these 49 ULBs were being they were being uh, interaction was happening on a monthly basis with these over local bodies, essentially to understand what kind of problems they encounter and how reforms can be introduced in the domain of the urban local bodies. Now, at, the, at about the same time as this continued, there was also this felt need to say that uh, while we can introduce the online tools, we can introduce the e-governance uh, interventions, but essentially it is important that these be adopted by the urban local bodies and integrated within their day-to-day -day working. And to ensure that the City Managers Association of Karnataka, which is another node in the network, was brought in. And this CMAC was essentially responsible then for increasing the utility of these reforms, the awareness of these reforms, and to ensure that urban local bodies integrated these reforms. Now, the reason why I actually trace this out is to, sh to show that it was through this iterative, iterative process of reform implementation that the state, that is the DMA, actually um, managed to implement the reforms in the 49 urban local bodies in a manner where it was able to accommodate the diverse needs of all the nodes within the network while ensuring that it was also able to monitor these urban local bodies. And in doing so, it did manage to fudge a lot of explicit and tacit knowledge that existed within the network. What this actually resulted was a certain sense of ownership amongst the local bodies for the reforms that were being implemented. There was a lot of fluidity in uh, relationships and I have some quotes here which I thought were really interesting. For example, I was told that while there were no reporting procedures and there was um, no formal agreement in terms of who will be, there were formal agreements in terms of who will be doing what, but essentially the team was working together every morning uh, uh, the main, uh, the DMA was sitting with the e-government foundation or with uh, Survey of India and it was like a family, we all worked together, there was a lot of in information exchange and dialogue on an everyday basis and this was what ensured the implementation of reforms. Now it was, when you look at these processes and uh, uh, I haven't detailed them out much but when you look at these processes it is essentially that it was through these processes that the state in a sense facilitated meta-governance. Now what happened was that as it scaled up to 164 towns, there was an increased demand for updates in the uh, need for technology. At the same time, there was a realization that reforms is a process that requires a very concerted effort. And therefore, the government of Karnataka, through the Department of Municipal Administration, actually put in place what it calls the municipal reform cell, which exists today. And this is essentially structured like a software company. It is um, staffed by software professionals and these professionals then <coughs> started to de develop and deploy technology. The consolidation of the reform cell happened in between 2005 to 2008 and at about the same time what also happened was that there was a certain degree of bureaucratic un instability that occurred within the program and I'll focus on that subsequently. There was also a change that happened in the policy environment at that point in time. As I mentioned earlier, the GNNURM came in that in about the same period, and uh, the the experience of Karnataka was scaled up to uh, for the uh, to reflect in the urban policy, which was across the country. And the GNNURM actually talks of much a much larger basket of e-governance reforms. Now, what happened at this point in time? was that e-government's foundation, which was essentially retained as a maintenance, uh, was de developing and deploying technology, began to be, uh, actually became a maintenance and support organization because the state started the, took over the function of developing and deploying technology for the remaining 164 towns. Uh, the reform cell, since it was a large entity, also started looking at training and capacity building of the urban local bodies. So in the process, it peripheralized even CMAC. And the monthly meetings, because it had scaled up, because the number of reforms increased from 5 to 24, the monthly meetings with the urban local bodies also transitioned. So what happened was that as it scaled up from the, from the 49 urban local bodies to the 164 local bodies, and there was a consolidation of the state entity as acquiring skills other than what it had earlier, that means it 
started for functioning as a software agency, its focus of reform implementation also transitioned. So in the earlier phase, while the reform implementation focused largely on issues of governance and how urban local bodies would be able to you know, integrate these reforms in their day-to-day -day functioning, essentially what happened was in the second phase, the focus technology became the focus. So there was a transition from governance to e-governance. I mean, e as in the focus was largely on technology. Now, this is what I was saying uh, earlier, that if you look at this particular graphic, between there was this bureaucratic st instability that happened post-2010. If you look at the number of heads or the champions that changed, was numerous. Between two, uh, 2010, especially in the municipal reform cell, they changed from about three or four people, five changes that happened. And I was also told that this, this move from five uh, applications to 24 applications was also triggered by the ambition of the champions who were coming in and therefore the program in itself, the understanding of reforms transition sub substantially. So the point I'm making over here is that in this period between 2002-2003 till about 2010-2012, the state actually, while it put in place a network or a network form of governance and was central to the functioning of this network form of governance, essentially transitioned from being a participant node, which was in the earlier phase, where it was ensuring participation of all the nodes, to a lead node, where it was still central. So when it started to, when it became a lead node, the state continued to be a central node, yet in being a central node, it started peripheralizing and it started brokering and centralizing all the decisions. So if you look at this particular uh, diagram, in the first phase, the state, there was leadership stability because of which there was a possibility to for, uh, forge explicit and tacit knowledge. And this, in turn, generated a lot of social capital within the network, which allowed the network to proceed in terms of implementation in the envisaged manner. But when once it scaled up, because of leadership instability and because of a lack of social capital, there was a loss of reflexivity reflexivity. Basically, most of the nodes in the hierarchy, while well, they existed, CMAC existed, e-government governments existed, all these became peripheral to the functioning of the hierarchy, and the state emerged as the central node, centralizing and brokering all the decisions. And in the process, there was nothing akin to meta-governance. Now, this essentially had implications on the way the outcomes of the reforms panned out at the uh, urban local body. And this is what I will focus on in the next 10 to 15 minutes. I look at two reforms. I look at, there are, it is a basket of five reforms. I essentially focus on two reforms. Uh, the first is the helpline, which is a public grievance and redressal mechanism. And the second is a property taxation and information uh, system, which has also been implemented at a statewide level. Both these reforms have been. Now, when I first started, most of my initial discussions were at the state level, but when I started to look at how these reforms were doing at the urban local body, I was told, for instance, that the helpline has been, uh, the helpline is perceived to be relatively less successful as compared to the ASTI. And I was told that I must go and look at ASTI because it's a very uh, su su successful reform. Now, for me, this was really, and, and they were, of course, uh, similar opinions within the state, within the DMA, that there are certain, certain urban local bodies which are doing better than the others. For instance, I was told that the Hassan local body is a much better performer as compared to Bida. So both the helpline and the ASTI are political reforms. Helpline is the basis for efficient service delivery and therefore the basis for uh, re-elections. And ASTI, anything that has to do with taxation, tax and assess assessment, enhancement and collection is not very politically very popular. So for me, it came in as a surprise to say that what is, why is it that the helpline is a success while ASTI, which should have been unsuccessful, is, is relatively more successful than um, the helpline. Now, so it is with this thing that I went into the field to understand what success means and what uh, to the various stakeholders, especially to the three target groups that we are looking at, and what does it imply in terms of the three target groups. Now, before I get into explaining what these reforms are, how these reforms are working at the grassroots level, a very quick, quick look at the structure of a typical urban local body in the state of Karnataka, and for that matter, for most of India. The urban local body actually is headed by a technocrat 
who is the commissioner, who has all the technical departments under him. So you have the engineering, water supply, sanitation, revenue, all these departments are um, under the commissioner. The local body is also has an active set of councillors who are supposed to steer and steer the functioning of the local body. The councillors are headed by a president. Now what the government of Karnataka has done, it has created certain systemic changes in the structure of the state. To begin with, it has introduced in all the urban local bodies, it has introduced an IT cell, an information technology cell, which is staffed by programmers and data entry operators. Now, it is this cell which is actually facilitating the implementation and uptake of reforms. What it has also done is that it has instituted a separate cell called the helpline. As I said, this is the there is an NGO and the helpline is essentially being manned and managed by this NGO. The idea was that the bringing in an NGO will add credibility to the system, essentially because here is a third party who is willing to listen to the complaints of the citizen and therefore the citizens will have this confidence that the complaints will be redressed. What it also did is that it prescribed a citizen service center for all, all urban local bodies in the state. So it was mandated that most local bodies should put in place the citizen service center which will assist citizens as far as the reforms or engaging with the reforms was concerned. Now these are just a few uh, photographs I have over here. Uh, this is, uh, these are for Hassan. So if you look at this, this is what a typical um, you know, helpline looks like. This is the fellow from the NGO who looks at, who mans the helpline on a 24 by 7 uh, basis. He is the one who is responsible, he has got this computer and the online, he he's the one who deals with the online tool. And then you, this is what an IT cell looks like. So in the in case of Hassan, they have not put a citizen service center in place. So essentially, the citizen interacts with the um, staff of the IT cell through these grills. So if he or she needs anything, they just put in their hand through these grills. And these, uh, interestingly, most of the IT cells across the state, I went to about 12 uh, local bodies, these are staffed by women. And most of them are young programmers probably in the age of 18 to 25. Okay, now uh, if you look at the helpline, the online tool as I said is a 24 bar 7 uh, tool, uh, is a, the helpline is a 24 bar 7 uh, cell where citizens are allowed to register their complaints via a telephone or via an email or through paper. Once the complaint is registered, the, the citizen gets a complaint number. Uh, which the citizen can use to track the status of his or her complaint to understand whether the complaint has not been redressed. The online tool also is capable of segregating the complaints as per the various departments, escalating these complaints to the various departments and once the complaint is escalated, it is, um, it is accessed by the concerned person. Once it is redressed, the concerned pers person is supposed to log in, give the status of how it has been redressed, the complaint, and this is then checked by the helpline, and once the complaint is redressed, the helpline posts the status, the helpline staff posts the status to say whether the complaint has been redressed, and if not, what is the reason for why it has not been redressed. So essentially, it's this, what the, in this process through this online tool, they have tried to build in uh, accountability enhancing mechanism by issuing this um, uh, complaint number. What it also does is that it gives a 72 hour deadline to the staff to redress the complaint. If it is not redressed within the 72 hour deadline, it typically reflects in the annual performance report of the technical staff and can result in uh, sanctions finally. So this is another in, in accountability enhancing mechanism. As I said, the NGO is supposed to add credibility to the system and most importantly, in, in issuing this complaint number, this online tool actually generates these online databases which while telling what is the nature of complaints and the location of these complaints in the urban local body also reflects the efficiency of the local body in terms of it being able to address these complaints or not. Now, when I went to the urban local bodies, both Hassan and Bida and several others that I have visited, I found that the helpline is not working as anticipated. Now, prior to the introduction of the helpline, the citizen would typically approach the counsellor and the counsellor would then get in touch with the technical staff and the complaint was registered and redressed via the elected representative. And when I went to the local body, I found that 
while it was envisaged that the citizen will go to the helpline and then this, this is the chain that will work. He said, in a sense, this is the chain that continued to work. So given this fact, I also, what it really essentially means is that the online databases that are being generated by this online tool are not really reflecting the real numbers and the redressal statistics um, as far as the urban efficiency of the urban local body is concerned. Also, I found that the 72-hour deadline was not working. The helpline staff was instructed to just close the complaint irrespective of whether it has been redressed or not by the urban local body. And I also found that because the NGO was not fully, uh, was completely occupied because the helpline hardly receives, it is about 20% of the complaints are being uh, channelized through the helpline, the NGO is being used by the urban local body as an outsource. So, you know, everything that the urban local body has to do, anything to re related to computers, it is outsourced to the NGO. Now, what I also found, my interviews with the uh, councillors also revealed that, you know, they are very much aware of how this helpline, what is the relevance of this helpline, and that they, uh, they agree with the concept of the helpline, and they said that we are willing to work with the helpline, but the fact that we are being left out is, they were not willing to accept that, and in the process what they have done is they have at their own independent level set up their own helplines, which constitute actually the parallel flows of information in this. So, there are a couple of things that came out. One, as I said, the NGO was being used as an outsource, and the urban local body in any case is not using the online tool at all. And the, the uh, the NGO which has been brought in as a, a credibility enhancing mechanism is essentially is being looked upon as a state which is by the citizen. For the citizen it's a state which will ensure complaint redressal but that is not how it is working. So, and this in turn was impacting accountability and ownership of reform, something that I will touch uh, subsequently. Now if you look at the property taxation and information systems, the first challenge was the standardization of a tax ass assessment and enhancement across urban local bodies. As I said, it's not a, it's a political reform and therefore this is not something very uh, easy to crack with. So what they did was that they actually pre, pre the, uh, before the introduction of the reform, there was a very arbitrary system of tax assessment and enhancement and th this was largely determined by the government's uh, assessing office officers and often resulted in negotiations between the official uh, and the owner of the property. Now, with the introduction of ASTI, they actually introduced a standardized system which was based on self-assessment. The act had to be modified and the act was modified to bring in a system which said that it, the tax would be enhanced every three years, anywhere between 15 to 30 percent, uh, as was de decided by the municipal councils. There was resistance by most municipal councillors because they were not ready to enhance the tax. And it, was over, uh, and it was only over a period of one year of the municipal reform cell, working with the councillors via the bureaucrats, that they were able to bring in the system of tax ass uh, assessment and enhancement. And this happened uh, primarily because of the negotiations that were, they were able to do with councillors. Now, the point that I'm trying to make over here is that it is in a democracy like India, unless you do not anchor the reform democratically, as in the case of ASTI, it is very difficult to bring about any success for the reform. And, and that has been shown very clearly in the case of Helpline. Now, as an online tool, what also happened, well, the online tool uh, takes care of all the steps of the tax assessment and uh, enhancement and collection process. What the government of, and I will not get into the details of this, except the fact that what the government of Karnataka did was, that it introduced, or it, in the entire workflow process, which I've shown here, it digi digitized te step two of the uh, tax uh, assessment and uh, collection process, rather than step one. Step one actually deals with how tax can be calculated. And this is what the citizen actually, as soon as he comes into the urban local body, that is what he requires. But what the government did was that it's digitized step two. That means it, once you have paid your tax, you will get a tax paid receipt a computerized tax paid receipt. Now the idea of this was to enable the urban local body to capture property details in the online tool and in the process keep on enhancing its uh, databases. What it also does is, what the computerized tax paid receipt also does is 
that it generates, depending on the number of uh, receipts that are being generated, it again generates these databases which show what the financial health of the urban local body is and this, these databases are available to the Department of Municipal Administration so that it can monitor and supervise the urban local body. Now, it, as far as the calculation of the tax was concerned, what the government did was instituted officially what is called the tax advisors or intermediaries and these were the people who would, once the citizen came in, they would ta calculate the tax for the citizen and then once that has been done, the citizen will go to the bank, pay the tax, come back and collect his tax pay receipt from the um, local body. Now even in this, in this uh, 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 process, in this reform, I argue that the digitization of this form, only one step, has actually led to parallel flows of information because for all other steps, for example, if there is uh, some assessment has to be done by the local body for a property tax or if there is a mutation in property, the local body has to essentially rely on a manual system and that is what constitutes the parallel flows of information here. Now this is what, the, for example, the urban local body in Hassan looks like. This is the entry to the local. This is the entry to the local body, and the IT cell is located right at the back over here. This is what the IT cell looks like, and these are your tax uh, advisor or intermediaries who are engaging with the citizens and filling up this uh, tax forms for the citizens. Uh, these are basically strewn all over the local body, and if you look at this particular picture, this is actually the helpline. But because this fellow does not have any work, he is actually uh, doing the work of a tax advisor, and he's filling up the tax forms for the citizens. Now, these tax advisors, as per an official government order, are allowed to charge anywhere between uh, with, uh, anywhere between 25 to 50 rupees for each application that they file for the citizen. Now, as a process, and this is what is happening in Hassan, the citizen goes to the urban local body, he, gets, he goes to the tax advisor, he gets his tax uh, forms filled, then he goes to the bank where he deposits his tax, then he comes to the local body. He's supposed to come to the bill collector because the bill collector is supposed to note this information in his register. And then from there he is supposed to, then uh, the bill collector will advise him whether his property really exists in the manual system or in the computerized system. And then depending where his property exists, he will go and pick up the tax paid receipt, whether a manual or a computerized one. Now, if you look at the helpline and Hassan and Beaver, what the point I'm trying to make here is one, the first thing is that, of course, the democratic anchorage of the reforms is very essential. In both the reforms, there are parallel flows of information that are happening through the counselor in the helpline, through the manual system in the um, ASTI. The NGO is viewed as the state as, and the tax advisor is viewed as the state in both the reforms where they are not actually the state, therefore do not have any uh, mandate to be able to ensure accountability. In, in the online tools are not being able, not being used by the urban local bodies at all. And most importantly, the knowledge that exists, the tacit knowledge that exists within the staff of the urban local body, is not getting utilized anywhere. In fact, the databases that are being generated, while they are meaningless to a certain extent because of the parallel flows of information, are largely being relied by the DMA to be able to monitor the urban and urban local body. So in a way, the urban local body is today accountable to the state rather than being accountable to the citizen. And in that sense, there is more of centralization than decentralization. And this, I basically, I, I actually pin it down to the role that the state plays in the conception, in the design, and the implementation of the reforms. The state has mediated the technology, enactment of technology at the urban local body such that it allows it to discharge its own function of monitoring and supervising the local bodies rather than understanding how the local bodies can be strengthened and how the introduction of technology can in a sense benefit the citizen. Having said that, I would now end with a more positive note. I looked at the functioning of the ASTI when I went to Bidar to understand, because if you remember in the beginning I said that for the DMA, the Bidar was, Bidar was not performing so well. I did go to, ask, uh, to look at the functioning, especially of ASTI in Bidar, because that's what I was told, that as far as ASTI is concerned, Bidar is doing really badly. And I realized that somehow Bidar seems to have understood the whole process of 
e-governance and what it is supposed to bring in the kind of uh, benefits it is bringing to the citizens in a much better manner. When I entered Bida, I just noticed, this is the photograph, this is the entry to the urban local bodies and I noticed that there are no intermediaries sitting anywhere in the local bodies, local body. And when I went in, while I knew that ASTI was not fully operational over there, but I was told that filing of taxes requires only half a day leave and it has become very easy for us. And that, that's when I realized that what Bidar has done has actually put in a citizen service center in place. And the intermediaries or the tax advisors who were actually sitting uh, are supposed to do this for, uh, role of filling up the taxes have actually been institutionalized within this citizen service center in the form of these SAS counters, so self-assessment scheme counters. And once the citizen comes in, he gives his property details. What they have also done is that they have brought, at their own level, they have sourced a rudimentary online tool, which has been developed locally. And this tool actually allows them to calculate the tax for the citizen via the computer. So this is where this red spot is where the helpline is situated. The helpline is not working across most local, local bodies, but at least in the case of Vidar, I found that um, the ASTI reform was working quite well. Now, what is also interesting over here is that the, um, the, the SAS counter is collecting the same, same amount of money from the citizen. It is collecting somewhere between 25 to 50 rupees from the citizen to fill up the ASTI forms, but these are accounted for in the revenues of the urban local bodies and are essentially used by the urban local body to pay the uh, salaries of these uh, um, uh, staff which are looking at, which is manning the SAS counter. So having said that, basically the point I'm trying to make over here is that in, in the state adopting this centralized decentralization approach, the state at the, as in the state of uh, Karnataka, it all in the implementation strategy that it is uh, that it is adopting, it is very different. It actually pans out very different from the proclaimed vision it has for the program. It has treated itself as the primary stakeholder in the entire reforms process. It has mediated the enactment of technology such that it ensures that it is able to discharge its own function of supervising and monitoring the local, urban local bodies rather than understanding what is it that the urban local bodies require, what is it that the citizens require and where is the insertion of technology, where insertion of technology will happen best such that it will benefit the citizen. In a way the urban local bodies and the citizens are treated as secondary stakeholders. Now there are policy implications of this research largely in terms of First, in trying to understand what is the role of the state and how does this, there is this huge debate about how the state is central to the functioning of network forms of governance. But what I'm showing here is that while it can be central, this centrality need not necessarily aid governance in the way it is envisaged. And in showing both the phases of uh, the municipal reforms program, the NNP phase, the pilot stage, and the scale up. I'm actually highlighting the potentials and pitfalls of network forms of governance as modes of coordination. The other point that I'm making is that in this entire theory, development theory and the need for administrative reforms as a means to strengthen governance and therefore um, be able to have uh, governance, go using governance as a lens to deliver on development goals, unless this is uh, anchored democratically in a, in, a, in a country like India where democratic, uh, democratic concerns, uh, democratic governance has, um, has a major role to play, unless these reforms are not anchored democratically, it is very difficult to make any progress with the reforms. Now what I'm also trying to say is that in this entire debate of development, decentralization, and administrative reforms, there are certain inherent tensions within the structure and the functioning of the state which can produce unanticipated, reform, uh, unanticipated outcomes. And it is in recognition of these uh, inherent uh, tensions and in recognition of uh, these inherent tensions which exist in the <coughs> structure of the state that any progress can be made as far as these network forms of governance is concerned. I will end with this.